This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Oh, so I have some good old-fashioned fun today. I got an email. Let's see, I wrote this down on a piece of paper. I got an email from Jonathan Garner about a blog post from Derek Hernquist. Derek's blog post was titled, I have no idea what Tesla is worth, do you? And it was linking to a CNBC video with a technical analyst named Brian Shannon. And I believe somewhere in the past decade, Brian and I have connected on some level as well. So without any further ado, let me play this fine CNBC clip with a little commentary from me at Strategic Points. Looking at Tesla, for instance, uh, Tesla broke out uh, to new highs. So when you're looking at a breakout, ideally you want all-time highs. There's not that uh, element of supply that's ready to pounce on the market and, and slow it down. Secondly, uh, huge short position, as we know, in Tesla. Uh, and they had been squeezed in here pretty yeah, good. They're going to be running for the hills it, after the earnings it, it, report yesterday. It, right, exactly. So from 40 up to 195 or so, uh, and then pulled back in here. Um, and now it's looking like if we take a measured move, uh, that will give us a price objective up near about $270 a share. Now, it's obviously not for the faint of heart. Now, I do share with Brian the technical analysis view. I don't share the view of a price target. So we have a, we'll have to agree to disagree there. Let me let it continue. Because it's super volatile. But I think there's still a lot of opportunity left there. And the shorts have been incredibly stubborn. I think it's just turning over new shorts. There's still about 29 million shares short there. What, what do you think about Caesars? That's the next one we want to look at. Caesars is a good looking chart as well. If we can clear that off, we can see that. Again, we've got a nice longer-term uptrend. Uh, just recently, we've got a little cup and handle here, and we've got a little bit of resistance at these current levels right now at 23. Now, it's spent a few days above $23 a share. Now, mind you, those terms, cup and handle, resistance, those are not part of the vocabulary of a trend-following trader. A pure predictive technical analyst might go that direction, but that's not trend-following. And... You're going to see where I'm going with this. I'm not attempting to beat up Brian right now. He's at least trying to fight the good fight from a chart perspective, from a price action perspective. Wait for one of CNBC's finest to enter the conversation. But we now have 7 million shares short in here as well. So there's a potential that getting back above that uh, 23 level with some uh, expanding volume, we can see this one move nicely. And mo most importantly, though, I think a stop just underneath one of these two higher lows, whatever the individual is comfortable with. Let's talk about the SPY. Yesterday, we were trying to get back to the flat line uh, for the year. So as we look at what the market's doing today, we're trying to figure out whether this bull market is still intact or not. <clears throat> uh, what do the charts say? Now, of course, the bull market is intact until it's not. There's nothing to figure out. Price up, it's up. Let me let them continue. Chart saying we're uh, in an uptrend, innocent until proven guilty. We've had some good pullbacks over the last uh, several years that we've been in this bull market, and we've climbed the wall of worry, but price, buyers keep coming in. So as long as the pattern of higher lows is, and higher highs is still uh, uninterrupted, and it's until proven guilty. I go by fundamentals, and to me, you know, when you, you never say, look at the technicals whatsoever. No, I do look at technicals. I absolutely look at technicals. I look at volume, but they just don't control what I do. I don't know who this guy is, so somebody can identify him. Some CNBC talking head looks like he's got curly hair. I don't know who he is, but he's going to expand a little bit more about uh, his lack of belief in technical analysis. When you could say if the stock does this on the chart, then I'll do that. But if it does this, I'm going to do that. I just don't find that to be helpful. So I'm not diminishing or belittling what you say. It's just not what I do. I'm purely a bottom-up fundamental stock picker. Well, it's got well, that's fantastic that he's a bottom-up fundamental stock picker. What the hell is he talking about, though, that he uses technical analysis? This guy clearly has no clue. Now, it's not unusual 
for CNBC hosts to have no clue when it comes to technical analysis, when it comes to trend following. I think there's been four to five interviews with David Harding, one of the top trend following traders in the world. Those are all worth going to pull. I've played them on my podcast. Fantastic stuff. Let me let this guy continue. Scott, if I could, let me just let me just help with that. I do think it's important to look at technicals nowadays, whether you believe in their validity or not, because so many folks in the algorithmic space are orienting their quant models towards it. So you have to understand the levels at which they're going to act and react to the market and initiate trades. That's a fair point. I agree with him. If you're a purely fundamental guy or gal, it makes a lot of sense. And I gave this presentation to about 40 different firms in Asia last year. If you're purely a fundamental trader, you have to know what trend following is, what it does, and how it behaves. Let me let it continue. You got a final point you want to make? At the end of the day, fundamentals are obviously very important. They're a huge driver to shaping the psychology of the market. But what we can do is analyze that psychology and see where the supply and demand are on the chart. So there's a tremendous amount of value in technical analysis. And I think that anyone will find that they can uh, get better returns by adding it to their arsenal. He is 100% true when it comes to momentum. There's no doubt about it. You can look at the CTA trend following performance for decades. You can look at the academic research that's been coming out by the dozens and dozens of papers in the last few years. Let me let it continue. Thanks, let, let me ask you this question before you go. Quickly. Take a look at Tesla, okay? Is there anything, when they announce what they have to say, okay, is there anything that was driven by technicals there? That question makes no sense. You're just following the price action. It doesn't make a difference about Tesla's announcement. You follow the price action. You initiate on the price action. You have a stop loss based on the price action. That's it. Continuing. Sure, there's there's a big breakout. It's a big volume breakout. But the it wasn't driven by the technicals. The fundamentals. It wasn't driven by technicals. Now, if you took a look at Tesla the other day when the stock came down eight bucks, nine bucks in front of earnings, I mean, would that have caused you some concern, the technicals? Absolutely, it would have ca caused me concern because the, the, there's nervousness in front of the earnings. And being a technical trader, I tend to move to the sidelines when we have a big event like that. We want to know what the catalyst is. Let the dust settle a little bit and say, what's the trend and where can I get into that trend in a low risk spot where there's still enough potential upside? So you would so miss 20 percent upside or 10 percent upside in the stock because you went to the sidelines and not taking advantage of it. Now you're buying it up 10 percent. Defense is number one. I don't want to lose and see the stock gap down. If they didn't miss or if we or if they did miss, rather, or we're in a uh, bearish environment, the stock could have been down 20, 30 percent overnight. And to me, it's a matter of risk reward. And that's my personal style. So it's up to each individual to figure out what works best for them. Now, he does make a great point there. That was Brian Shannon concluding. And the point is one of risk management. Now, the curly haired CNBC guy clearly has absolutely no clue. I don't understand why put somebody on one of these shows? Why give someone the airtime if they literally have no clue? I mean, maybe it's all just to create controversy and get people to watch and get people like me to comment. But it would be nice if they actually seemed like they had a clue. I'm talking about the CNBC guy. Brian's 100% right in the stop loss mentality. Control your downside. No one has unlimited capital. That's what you're trying to protect. Your, your scarce capital, your precious capital, that's what you're trying to protect. The upside will take care of itself. A good opening piece for this monologue. I just thought it was a nice kind of wrap your arms around how this subject is so confused. The subject of technical analysis, and I established this in my first book, Trend Following. There is predictive and there is reactive technical analysis. I don't know Brian's full style, but it sounded like he was coming more from the predictive technical analysis standpoint. Trend following is reactive. So all of the issues they were talking about in that entire episode, not relevant. Not relevant to a trend following trader. Let me continue with another example. So this is kind of a fun example. A guy that I met 
at a random get together uh, was a young guy. He was in his 20s and he just announced out of the blue at this grouping of people. He just said, well, I bought $10,000 with a Facebook and he was showing me his iPhone. He's like, look, I just got filled. I'm like, okay, that's great. So what's the strategy? What's your plan? He's like, well, I'm going to hold on to it until it goes up to 90. Like very matter of fact, like it's guaranteed to go to 90. I'm going to hold on to it until it goes up to 90. And I said, what about the downside? When are you going to get out? He goes, oh, I'm not going to get out. I said, well, you don't care if you lose the money. What if it goes way back? Or you, what if it goes, what if you lose half? Oh, I don't care. I didn't push this too much. He was just a young guy, just talking, seemed like a nice guy, had no desire to push anything. So a friend of mine forwards to me his blog post, this young guy's blog post. He's apparently talking about this first time Facebook purchase. And so he was talking about how he made the decision to invest in Facebook. And he reached out to one of the wealthiest people that he knew. And this friend of his, his wealth influenced him to make the purchase in Facebook. So anyways, his friend writes him an email. This is the guy that I met who's buying the Facebook. His friend writes him an email and says, oh man, I wish you asked me this a few months ago. I put all my stock into Facebook at $49.50 and now it's close to seventy. I made more than $1 million. FB still has a little more room to run, probably to 80 or 90, but at this point, the risk is higher. If you want to invest in a stock and keep it there for a year, probably LinkedIn should have some room to run to 250 because of the WhatsApp deal. It just went up to 18 in the last two days. If you have a two-year horizon, probably PM, you can invest in both to diversify. These are stocks that I put my own money into, but as always, it's risky and the market may correct in the next two years. I think a correction will happen in 2016 to 2018, but can happen sooner. Good luck. Now, that was this young guy's friend who's made a ton of money, apparently. And that was the logic, the, the, the so-called rich guy. That was his logic for investing. That was the logic. Probably LinkedIn should have some room to run. If you have a two-year horizon, you can invest in both <laughs> to diversify. The market may correct. I think a correction will happen in 2016 to 2018. I mean, literally, this stuff is just made up out of thin air. So if you're going to listen, if you're going to follow any thought process, about how money is made. You have to scientifically dig in and look at the process. What was the process? This young guy, his friend that he's looking up to, this is his process. That's not a process. That's just gambling. And that's fine. A lot of people make fortunes gambling. But a lot of people that trade like that lose it all. That's the question you have to ask yourself. So, anyways, the young guy on his blog post gave some rationale, more rationale, as to why he invested in Facebook. And he said, I'm not a stock expert, but after watching The Wolf of Wall Street, I realized that many professionals aren't either. Okay, fair enough. That's probably a great point. He's right on target. He goes on to say, I chose to invest in Facebook shares because of three reasons. The advice from his friend and the fact that his own money is in FB shares. Wow, that is. <laughs> I can't. Not worth commenting on that. If you think that's a sound reason to own Facebook shares because somebody else owns Facebook shares. Ouch. Not a good plan. He says, number two, I constantly use Facebook daily, both as an end user and as a business owner buying ads. Okay. That has absolutely nothing to do with which way the stock price might move either up or down. 
That's simply guessing. That's not a scientific reason to make an investment. He continues, number three, Facebook ads used to be known not to convert and were a waste of money. But now with retargeting ads, a lot of businesses will start spending money on FB ads again, which means revenue for FB for Facebook. Okay, Facebook has revenue. Revenue does not directly tie to share price movement. Investing 101. Jesse Livermore 101. Trend trading 101. The only thing that ties to the movement of a stock is its price. If the price is moving, you've got something. Grab that tiger by the tail. If it's not moving, you don't have anything. And all these fundamental pieces of information. And let's face it, when you have an equity bull market, every piece of fundamental information, often much of which is nonsense, is dreamed up to justify the share price. But come on. The only thing we know, if we're looking at equity prices in general, in the U.S., is they're up. Why can't you just be satisfied with that? They're up. Now, we can delve into the details, and some of the bigger details might have a lot to do with the Fed, their actions. But who knows for sure? All we know is the price action says up. So when I asked this young guy about buying Facebook, he was talking about a profit target. I said, why the profit target? If you're going to buy it right now at all-time highs, get yourself a stop loss and then just ride the tiger. See how high it goes. Why the profit target? Why even do this? Because the profit target is just this, this arbitrage scalping mentality that you think, and this young guy thinks, that he will be able to get in, that the market will go the direction that he wants it to go, he will get out with a nice chunk of profit, but then he's faced with the next quandary. How do you get back in? How do you get back in? What's the next rule? Look, I'm not here to scare anybody away from making investing decisions. There are plenty of people out there whose wealth blows mine away. And they took some risky gambles and they made a fortune. That's the way the world goes. I was rereading a great piece the other day from Malcolm Gladwell about how Nassim Talib first went to meet Victor Niederhofer. Find this piece. I think it was in The New Yorker. Just a fantastic example of how the first visit to Niederhofer and Victor, I want you on my podcast. You, you have trained and influenced too many people. So I'd love to have you on the podcast. But my point of bringing this up was the up and down nature. That first visit to Niederhofer, he was riding high, just minting more money than any hedge fund manager could. And not but a few years later, the music stopped. So this question all comes down to risk and reward. Do you have a process? Do you have a system? Do you know what the risk and reward is? The idea is not to go broke. The idea is to not go broke. Preserve your capital. Have a plan that takes advantage of volatile markets to make money on the upside and the downside. But don't go broke. That's it. Two great examples today just to get people thinking about the process. What's the right process? And please, when you see these kinds of examples, send them to me. They're great. I don't see everything. I don't follow everything. Many of you out there see quite a bit more than I do. A lot of you know what I want in my wheelhouse, too. 
So it's, it's always nice when I get the emails and it's the fat pitch right across the plate. So most appreciative for the insight passed along to me today. Going out, a quick reminder. If you enjoy the podcast, if you enjoy the guests that I bring on, and I have got an absolute ton of great new guests coming in the next two to three weeks. In fact, I think it's four next week. So it's kind of a pain in the butt, though, for me in the sense that I have to do these interviews late at night because of my Asia location at the moment. But it's fun. You get to learn from some really, really bright people. Going out. If you like the podcast, go to iTunes. Write a review. I will be most appreciative. If you come this way to Southeast Asia, I will perhaps buy you a beating snake heart to consume and a shot of vodka filled with blood. Now, if you're not familiar with why I might say that, that was one of my little treats last fall that I got to experience. They bring a cobra out. They slice the cobra head from head to tail, pull the heart out, put it into a shot glass. They fill the shot glass with blood, spike it with vodka down the hatch. I never really expected that I would be doing that. And it really wasn't a dare or anything. It was just like when in Rome, do. But if you make it this way, and you're cool, and you've written a review on iTunes, I'd probably buy you a snake heart. Why not? It's not a bad offer. I'm probably the first person in the history of podcasting, which is a history that only goes back so far, but I'm probably the first person in the history of podcasting to say, hey, if you like my podcast and if you say something nice on iTunes, I will help you to consume a still beating snake heart combined with blood and vodka. Come on, that's an offer. What a great offer. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.